The cars came scudding in towards Dublin, running evenly like pellets in the groove of the Nace Road. At the crest of the hill at Inchicore, sightseers had gathered to watch the cars careering homeward, and through this channel of poverty and inaction the continent sped its wealth and industry. Now and again clumps of people raised the cheer of the gratefully oppressed. Their sympathy, however, was for the blue cars, the cars of their friends, the French. The French, moreover, were virtual victors. Their team had finished solidly. They had been placed second and third, and the driver of the winning German car was reported a Belgian. Each blue car therefore received a double measure of welcome as it topped the crest of the hill, and each cheer of welcome was acknowledged with smiles and nods by those in the car. In one of these cars was a party of four young men whose spirits seemed to be well above the level of successful gallicism. In fact, these four young men were almost hilarious. They were Charles Seguin, the owner of the car, André Rivière, a young electrician of Canadian birth, a huge Hungarian named Vilona, and a neatly groomed young man named Doyle. Seguin was in good humour because he had unexpectedly received some orders in advance. He was about to start a motor establishment in Paris. And Rivière was in good humour because he was to be appointed manager of the establishment. Villona was in good humour because he had had a very satisfactory luncheon. And besides, he was an optimist by nature. The fourth member of the party, however, was too excited to be genuinely happy. He was about twenty-six years of age, with a soft, light brown moustache and rather innocent-looking grey eyes. His father, who had begun life as an advanced nationalist, had modified his views early. He had made his money as a butcher in Kingstown, and by opening shops in Dublin and the suburbs he had made his money many times over. He had sent his son to England to be educated in a big Catholic college, and had afterwards sent him to Dublin University to study law. Jimmy did not study very earnestly and took to bad courses for a while. He had money and he was popular, and he divided his time curiously between musical and motoring circles. Then he had been sent for a term to Cambridge to see a little life. His father, remonstrative but covertly proud of the excess, had paid his bills and brought him home. It was at Cambridge that he had met Seguin. They were not much more than acquaintances as yet, but Jimmy found great pleasure in the society of one who had seen so much of the world and was reputed to own some of the biggest hotels in France. Such a person, as his father agreed, was well worth knowing, even if he had not been the charming companion he was. Villona was entertaining also, a brilliant pianist, but unfortunately very poor. The car ran on merrily with its cargo of hilarious youth. Seguin and Rivière sat on the front seat. Jimmy and his Hungarian friend sat behind. Decidedly, Villona was in excellent spirits. He kept up a deep bass hum of melody for miles of the road. Rapid motion through space elates one. So does notoriety. So does the possession of money. These were three good reasons for Jimmy's excitement. He had been seen by many of his friends that day in the company of these Continentals. At the control, Seguin had presented him to one of the French competitors, and in answer to his confused murmur of compliment, the swarthy face of the driver had disclosed a line of shining white teeth. It was pleasant, after that honour, to return to the profane world of spectators amid nudges and significant looks. Then, as to money, he really had a great sum under his control. Seguin, perhaps, would not think it a great sum, but Jimmy, who, in spite of temporary errors, was at heart the inheritor of solid instincts, knew well with what difficulty it had been got together. This knowledge had previously kept his bills within the limits of reasonable recklessness. And if he had been so conscious of the labour latent in money when there had been question merely of some freak of the higher intelligence, how much more so now, when he was about to stake the greater part of his substance? It was a serious thing for him. 
Of course, the investment was a good one, and Séguin had managed to give the impression that it was by a favour of friendship the might of Irish money was to be included in the capital of the concern. Jimmy had a respect for his father's shrewdness in business matters, and in this case it had been his father who had first suggested the investment. Money to be made in the motor business. Pots of money. Moreover, Séguin had the unmistakable air of wealth. Jimmy set out to translate into day's work that lordly car in which he sat. How smoothly it ran! In what style had they come careering along the country roads? The journey laid a magical finger on the genuine pulse of life, and gallantly the machinery of human nerves strove to answer the bounding courses of the swift blue animal. They drove down Dame Street. The street was busy with unusual traffic, loud with the horns of motorists and the gongs of impatient tram drivers. Near the bank, Seguin drew up, and Jimmy and his friend alighted. A little knot of people collected on the footpath to pay homage to the snorting motor. The party was to dine together that evening in Seguin's hotel, and meanwhile Jimmy and his friend, who was staying with them, were to go home to dress. The car steered out slowly for Grafton Street while the two young men pushed their way through the knot of gazers. They walked northward with a curious feeling of disappointment in the exercise, while the city hung its pale globes of light above them in a haze of summer evening. In Jimmy's house this dinner had been pronounced an occasion. A certain pride mingled with his parents' trepidation, a certain eagerness also to play fast and loose, for the names of great foreign cities have at least this virtue. Jimmy, too, looked very well when he was dressed, and as he stood in the hall giving a last equation to the bows of his dress tie, his father may have felt even commercially satisfied at having secured for his son qualities often unpurchasable. His father, therefore, was unusually friendly with Valona, and his manner expressed a real respect for foreign accomplishments. But this subtlety of his host was probably lost upon the Hungarian, who was beginning to have a sharp desire for his dinner. The dinner was excellent, exquisite. Séguin, Jimmy decided, had a very refined taste. The party was increased by a young Englishman named Routh, whom Jimmy had seen with Séguin at Cambridge. The young men supped in a snug room lit by electric candle lamps. They talked volubly and with little reserve. Jimmy, whose imagination was kindling, conceived the lively youth of the Frenchmen twined elegantly upon the firm framework of the Englishman's manner. A graceful image of his, he thought, and a just one. He admired the dexterity with which their host directed the conversation. The five young men had various tastes and their tongues had been loosened. Valona, with immense respect, began to discover, to the mildly surprised Englishman, the beauties of the English madrigal, deploring the loss of old instruments. Riviere, not wholly ingenuously, undertook to explain to Jimmy the triumph of the French mechanicians. The resonant voice of the Hungarian was about to prevail in ridicule of the spurious lutes of the Romantic painters when Séguin shepherded his party into politics. Here was congenial ground for all. Jimmy, under generous influences, felt the buried zeal of his father wake to life within him. He aroused the torpid Routh at last. The room grew doubly hot, and Séguin's task grew harder each moment. There was even danger of personal spite. The alert host at an opportunity lifted his glass to humanity, and when the toast had been drunk... He threw open a window significantly. That night the city wore the mask of a capital. The five young men strolled along Stephen's Green in a faint cloud of aromatic smoke. They talked loudly and gaily, and their cloaks dangled from their shoulders. The people made way for them. At the corner of Grafton Street, a short, fat man was putting two handsome ladies on a car in charge of another fat man. The car drove off, and the short, fat man caught sight of the party. Andre, It's Farley! A torrent of talk followed. Farley was an American. No one knew very well what the talk was about. Villona and Riviere were the noisiest, but all the men were excited. 
They got up in a car, squeezing themselves together amid much laughter. They drove by the crowd, blended now into soft colours, to a music of merry bells. They took the train at Westland Row, and in a few seconds, as it seemed to Jimmy, they were walking out of Kingstown Station. The ticket collector saluted Jimmy. He was an old man. Fine night, sir. It was a serene summer night. The harbour lay like a darkened mirror at their feet. They proceeded towards it with linked arms, singing Cadet Roussel in chorus, stamping their feet at every ho ho, ho hey vraiment. They got into a rowboat at the slip and made out for the American's yacht. There was to be supper, music, cards. Villona said with conviction, It is delightful. There was a yacht piano in the cabin. Villona played a waltz for Farley and Riviere, Farley acting as cavalier and Riviere as lady. Then an impromptu square dance, the men devising original figures. What merriment! Jimmy took his part with a will. This was seeing life at least. Then Farley got out of breath and cried, Stop! A man brought in a light supper, and the young men sat down to it for form's sake. They drank, however. It was bohemian. They drank Ireland, England, France, Hungary, the United States of America. Jimmy made a speech, a long speech, Valona saying, Hear, hear, whenever there was a pause. There was a great clapping of hands when he sat down. It must have been a good speech. Farley clapped him on the back and laughed loudly. What jovial fellows, what good company they were. Cards, cards. The table was cleared. Villona returned quietly to his piano and played voluntaries for them. The other men played game after game, flinging themselves boldly into the adventure. They drank the health of the Queen of Hearts and of the Queen of Diamonds. Jimmy felt obscurely the lack of an audience. The wit was flashing. Play ran very high and paper began to pass. Jimmy did not know exactly who was winning, but he knew that he was losing. But it was his own fault, for he frequently mistook his cards, and the other men had to calculate his IOUs for him. They were devils of fellows, but he wished they would stop. It was getting late. Someone gave the toast of the yacht, the bell of Newport, and then someone proposed one great game for a finish. The piano had stopped. Villona must have gone up on deck. It was a terrible game. They stopped just before the end of it to drink for luck. Jimmy understood that the game lay between Routh and Seguin. What excitement! Jimmy was excited too. He would lose, of course. How much had he written away? The men rose to their feet to play the last tricks, talking and gesticulating. Routh won. The cabin shook with the young men's cheering and the cards were bundled together. They began then to gather in what they had won. Farley and Jimmy were the heaviest losers. He knew that he would regret in the morning, but at present he was glad of the rest, glad of the dark stupor that would cover up his folly. He leaned his elbows on the table and rested his head between his hands, counting the beats of his temples. The cabin door opened and he saw the Hungarian standing in a shaft of grey light. Daybreak, gentlemen! The grey, warm evening of August had descended upon the city, and a mild air, a memory of summer, circulated in the streets. The streets, shuttered for the repose of Sunday, swarmed with a gaily coloured crowd. Two young men came down the hill of Rutland Square. One of them was just bringing a long monologue to a close. The other, who walked on the verge of the path and was at times obliged to step onto the road, owing to his companion's rudeness, wore an amused, listening face. He was squat and ruddy. A yachting cap was shoved far back from his forehead, 
and the narrative to which he listened made constant waves of expression break forth over his face from the corners of his nose and eyes and mouth. Little jets of wheezing laughter followed one another out of his convulsed body. His eyes, twinkling with cunning enjoyment, glanced at every moment towards his companion's face. Once or twice he rearranged the light waterproof which he had slung over one shoulder in Toreador fashion. His breeches, his white rubber shoes, and his jauntily slung waterproof expressed youth. But his figure fell into rotundity at the waist. His hair was scant and grey, and his face, when the waves of expression had passed over it, had a ravaged look. When he was quite sure that the narrative had ended, he laughed noiselessly for fully half a minute. Then he said, Well, that takes the biscuit. That takes the solitary, unique, and if I may so call it, recherche biscuit. He became silent when he had said this. His tongue was tired, for he had been talking all the afternoon in a public house in Dorset Street. Most people considered Lenehan a leech, but in spite of this reputation, his adroitness and eloquence had always prevented his friends from forming any general policy against him. He had a brave manner of coming up to a party of them in a bar and of holding himself nimbly at the borders of the company until he was included in a round. He was a sporting vagrant armed with a vast stock of stories, limericks and riddles. He was insensitive to all kinds of discourtesy. No one knew how he achieved the stern task of living, but his name was vaguely associated with racing tissues. "'Where did you pick her up, Carly?' he asked. Corley ran his tongue swiftly along his upper lip. "'One night, man,' he said. "'I was going along Dame Street, and I spotted a fine tart and said, "'Good night, you know. "'So we went for a walk by the canal, "'and she told me she was a slavey in a house in Baggett Street. "'I put my arm round her and squeezed her a bit that night. "'Then next Sunday, man, I met her by appointment. "'We went out to Donnybrook, and I brought her into a field there.' It was fine, man. Cigarettes every night she'd bring me and paying the tram out and back. And one night she brought me two bloody fine cigars. Oh, the real cheese, you know, that the old fella used to smoke. I was afraid, man, she'd get in the family way, but she's up to the dodge. Maybe she thinks you'll marry her, said Lenehan. I told her I was out of a job, said Corley. She doesn't know my name, but she thinks I'm a bit of class, you know. Lanhan laughed again, noiselessly. Of all the good ones ever I heard, he said, that emphatically takes the biscuit. Corley's swing of his burly body acknowledged the compliment. He was the son of an inspector of police, and he had inherited his father's frame and gait. He walked with his hands by his sides, holding himself erect and swaying his head from side to side. At present he was about town. Whenever any job was vacant, a friend was always ready to give him the hard word. He was often to be seen walking with policemen in plain clothes, talking earnestly. Lenhan offered his friend a cigarette. Well, tell me, Carly, I suppose you'll be able to pull it off all right, eh? Carly closed one eye expressively as an answer. Is she game? asked Lenhan dubiously. You can never know women. She's all right, said Corley. I know the way to get around her, man. She's a bit gone on me. You're what I call a gay Lothario, said Lenehan. A shade of mockery relieved the servility of his manner. But Corley had not a subtle mind. There's nothing to touch a good slavey, he affirmed. First I used to go with girls, you know, girls off the South Circular. Used to take them out, man on the tram somewhere, and pay the tram, or take them to a band, or buy them chocolate. I used to spend money on them right enough. Lenehan nodded gravely. I know that game, and it's a mug's game. And damn the thing I ever got out of it, said Carly. Ditto here, said Lenehan, only off of one of them. Corley moistened his upper lip by running his tongue along it. The recollection brightened his eyes. She was... A bit of all right, he said regretfully. She's on the turf now. I saw her driving down Earl Street one night with two fellas. 
I suppose that's your doing, said Lenehan. There were others at her before me, said Corley philosophically. As they passed along the railings of Trinity College, Lenehan peered up at the clock. Twenty after. Time enough, said Corley. She'll be there all right. I always let her wait a bit. But tell me, said Lenehan again, are you sure you can bring it off all right? You know, it's a ticklish job. They're damn close on that point, eh? What? His bright, small eyes searched his companion's face for reassurance. I'll pull it off, Corley said. Leave it to me, can't you? Lenahan said no more. He did not wish to ruffle his friend's temper. They walked along Nassau Street and then turned into Kildare Street. Not far from the porch of the club, a harpist stood in the roadway, playing the melody of Silent O'Moyle to a little ring of listeners. The notes of the air sounded deep and full. The two young men walked up the street without speaking, the mournful music following them. When they reached Stephen's Green, they crossed the road. "'There she is,' said Corley. At the corner of Hume Street, a young woman was standing. She wore a blue dress and a white sailor hat. She stood swinging a sunshade in one hand. Lenehan grew lively. "'Let's have a look at her, Corley.' Corley glanced at his friend, and an unpleasant grin appeared on his face. "'Are you trying to get inside me?' he asked. Damn it, all I want is to have a look at her. Oh, a look at her, said Corley, more amiably. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll go over and talk to her and you can pass by. Right, said Lenahan, and after, where will we meet? Half ten, answered Corley, corner of Marion Street. Work it all right now, said Lenahan, in farewell. Corley did not answer. He sauntered across the road. He approached the young woman and, without saluting, began at once to converse with her. She swung her umbrella more quickly and executed half-turns on her heels. Once or twice when he spoke to her at close quarters, she laughed and bent her head. Lenehan observed them for a few minutes. Then he walked rapidly along at some distance and crossed the road. As he approached Hume Street corner, his eyes made a swift, anxious scrutiny of the young woman's appearance. She had her Sunday finery on. Her blue dress was held at the waist by a belt of black leather. She wore a short black jacket and a ragged black boa. Frank, rude health glowed in her face, on her fat red cheeks and in her unabashed blue eyes. She had broad nostrils, a straggling mouth which lay open in a contented leer, and two projecting front teeth. As he passed, Lenehan took off his cap, and after about ten seconds, Corley returned a salute to the air. Lenehan walked as far as the Shelburne Hotel, where he halted and waited. After a little time he saw them coming towards him, and when they turned to the right he turned and went back the way he had come. Now that he was alone, his gaiety seemed to forsake him. He walked listlessly round Stephen's Green and then down Grafton Street. The problem of how he could pass the hours till he met Corley again troubled him a little. He kept on walking. He turned to the left when he came to the corner of Rutland Square and felt more at ease in the dark, quiet street, the sombre look of which suited his mood. He paused at last before the window of a poor-looking shop over which the words Refreshment Bar were printed. On the glass of the window were two flying inscriptions, Ginger Beer and Ginger Ale. After glancing warily up and down the street, he went into the shop quickly. He was hungry, for he had eaten nothing since breakfast time. He sat down at a wooden table. A slatternly girl waited on him. How much is a plate of peas? he asked. Three halfpence, sir, said the girl. Bring me a plate of peas, he said, and a bottle of ginger beer. The girl brought him a plate of grocer's hot peas, seasoned with pepper and vinegar, a fork and his ginger beer. He ate his food greedily and found it so good that he made a note of the shop mentally. When he had eaten all the peas, he sipped his ginger beer and sat for some time thinking of Corley's adventure. In his imagination, he beheld the pair of lovers walking along some dark road. He heard Corley's voice in deep, energetic gallantries and saw again the leer of the young woman's mouth. This vision made him feel keenly his own poverty of purse and spirit. 
He was tired of knocking about, of shifts and intrigues. He would be 31 in November. Would he never get a good job? Would he never have a home of his own? He had walked the streets long enough with friends and with girls. He knew what those friends were worth. He knew the girls too. Experience had embittered his heart against the world. But all hope had not left him. He felt better after having eaten, less weary of his life. He might yet be able to settle down in some snug corner and live happily if he could only come across some good, simple-minded girl with a little of the ready. He paid Tuppence Hapney to the slatternly girl and went out of the shop to begin his wandering again. He went into Capel Street and walked along towards the city hall. At the corner of George's Street he met two friends of his and stopped to converse with them. He was glad that he could rest from all his walking. He left his friends at a quarter to ten and set off briskly, hurrying for fear Corley should return too soon. When he reached the corner of Merrion Street, he took his stand in the shadow of a lamp and brought out one of the cigarettes which he had reserved and lit it. His mind became active again. He wondered had Corley managed it successfully. All at once the idea struck him that perhaps Corley had given him the slip. His eyes searched the street. There was no sign of them. Would Corley do a thing like that? He strained his eyes as each tram stopped at the far corner of the square. They must have gone home by another way. The paper of his cigarette broke and he flung it into the road with a curse. Suddenly he saw them coming towards him. They did not seem to be speaking. He knew Corley would fail. He knew it was no go. They turned on Baggett Street and he followed them. When they stopped, he stopped too. They talked for a few moments and then the young woman went down the steps into the area of a house. Corley remained standing a little distance from the front steps. Some minutes passed. Then the hall door was opened slowly and cautiously. A woman came running down the steps. Corley went towards her. His broad figure hid hers from view for a few seconds. And then she reappeared, running up the steps. The door closed, and Corley began to walk swiftly towards Stephen's green. Lenehan hurried on in the same direction. Anxiety and his swift run made him pant. He called out, Hello, Corley! Corley continued walking as before. Hello, Corley! He came level with his friend and looked keenly in his face. Well, he said, did it come off? They had reached the corner of Eli Place. Still without answering, Corley went up the side street. His features were composed in stern calm. Lenahan kept up with his friend, breathing uneasily. Can't you tell us, he said. Did you try her? Corley halted at the first lamp and stared grimly before him. Then with a grave gesture he extended a hand towards the light and, smiling, opened it slowly to the gaze of his disciple. A small gold coin shone in the palm. Mrs. Mooney was a butcher's daughter. She was a woman who was quite able to keep things to herself. A determined woman. She had married her father's foreman and opened a butcher's shop near Spring Gardens. But as soon as his father-in-law was dead, Mr. Mooney began to go to the devil. He drank, plundered the till, ran headlong into debt. By fighting his wife in the presence of customers and by buying bad meat, he ruined his business. One night he went for his wife with the cleaver, and she had to sleep in a neighbor's house. After that they lived apart. She went to the priest and got a separation from him with care of the children. She would give him neither money nor house room, and so he was obliged to enlist as a sheriff's man. He was a shabby, stooped little drunkard with a white face. Mrs. Mooney, who had taken what remained of her money out of the butcher business and set up a boarding house in Hardwick Street, was a big, imposing woman. Her house had a floating population made up of tourists and occasionally artistes from the music halls. 
Its resident population was made up of clerks from the city. She governed her house cunningly and firmly, knew when to be stern and when to let things pass. All the resident young men spoke of her as the madam. Mrs. Mooney's young men paid fifteen shillings a week for board and lodgings, beer or stout at dinner excluded. They shared in common tastes and occupations, and for this reason they were very chummy with one another. Jack Mooney, the madam's son, who was clerk to a commission agent, had the reputation of being a hard case. He was fond of using soldiers' obscenities. Usually he came home in the small hours. He was also handy with the mitts and sang comic songs. On Sunday nights there would often be a reunion in Mrs. Mooney's drawing room. The music hall artistes would oblige and played waltzes and vamped accompaniments. Polly Mooney, the madam's daughter, would also sing. She sang, I'm a naughty girl. You needn't sham. You know I am. Polly was a slim girl of nineteen. She had light, soft hair and a small, full mouth. As Polly was very lively, the intention was to give her the run of the young men. Besides, young men like to feel that there's a young woman not very far away. Mrs. Mooney had first sent her daughter to be a typist in a corn factor's office. But as a disreputable sheriff's man used to come every day to the office, asking to be allowed to see his daughter, she had taken her daughter home again and set her to do housework. Polly, of course, flirted with the young men, but Mrs. Mooney, who was a shrewd judge, knew that they were only passing the time away. None of them meant business. Mrs. Mooney began to think of sending Polly back to typewriting. When she noticed that something was going on between Polly and one of the young men, she watched the pair and kept her own counsel. Polly knew that she was being watched, but still her mother's persistent silence could not be misunderstood. There had been no open complicity between mother and daughter, but though people in the house began to talk of the affair, still Mrs. Mooney said nothing. Polly began to grow a little strange in her manner, and the young man was evidently perturbed. At last, when she judged it to be the right moment, Mrs. Mooney intervened. She dealt with moral problems as a cleaver deals with meat, and in this case she had made up her mind. It was a bright Sunday morning of early summer. Breakfast was over, and Mrs. Mooney sat in the straw armchair and watched the servant, Mary, remove the breakfast things. She made Mary collect the crusts and pieces of broken bread to help to make Tuesday's bread pudding. When the table was cleared, she began to reconstruct the interview which she had had the night before with Polly. Things were as she had suspected— she had been frank in her questions, and Polly had been frank in her answers. Both had been somewhat awkward, of course. She had been made awkward by her not wishing to seem to have connived. And Polly had been made awkward not merely because illusions of that kind always made her awkward, but also because she did not wish it to be thought that in her wise innocence she had divined the intention behind her mother's tolerance. Mrs. Mooney glanced at the clock on the mantelpiece. It was seventeen minutes past eleven. She would have lots of time to have the matter out with Mr. Doran and then catch short twelve at Marlborough Street. She was sure she would win. To begin with, she had all the weight of social opinion on her side. She was an outraged mother. She had allowed him to live beneath her roof, assuming that he was a man of honour, and he had simply abused her hospitality. He was thirty-four or thirty-five years of age, so that youth could not be pleaded as his excuse, nor could ignorance, since he was a man who had seen something of the world. He had simply taken advantage of Polly's youth and inexperience. That was evident. The question was, what reparation would he make? There must be reparation made in such cases. Some mothers would be content to patch up such an affair for a sum of money. But she would not do so. For her, only one reparation could make up for the loss of her daughter's honour. Marriage. She counted all her cards again before sending Mary up to Mr. Doran's room to say that she wished to speak with him. She felt sure she would win. He was a serious young man, not rakish like the others. She did not think he would face publicity. 
All the lodgers in the house knew something of the affair. Besides, he had been employed for thirteen years in a great Catholic wine merchant's office, and publicity would mean for him, perhaps, the loss of his job. She stood up and surveyed herself in the pier glass. The decisive expression of her great florid face satisfied her, and she thought of some mother she knew who could not get their daughters off their hands. Mr. Doran was very anxious indeed this Sunday morning. He had made two attempts to shave, but his hand had been so unsteady that he had been obliged to desist. Three days' reddish beard fringed his jaws, and every few minutes a mist gathered on his glasses so that he had to take them off and polish them. The recollection of his confession of the night before was a cause of acute pain to him. The priest had drawn out every ridiculous detail of the affair, and in the end had so magnified his sin that he was almost thankful at being afforded a loophole of reparation. The harm was done. What could he do now but marry her or run away? He could not brazen it out. The affair would be sure to be talked of, and his employer would be certain to hear of it. He felt his heart leap as he heard in his excited imagination old Mr. Leonard calling out in his rasping voice, "'Send Mr. Doran here, please!' All his long years of service gone for nothing, all his industry and diligence thrown away. As a young man he had sown his wild oats, of course. He had boasted of his free thinking and denied the existence of God to his companions in public houses. But that was all past and done with. Nearly. He still bought a copy of Reynolds' newspaper every week, but he attended to his religious duties and for nine-tenths of the year lived a regular life. He had money enough to settle down on. It was not that, but the family would look down on her. First of all, there was her disreputable father, and then her mother's boarding-house was beginning to get a certain fame. He could imagine his friends talking of the affair and laughing. She was a little vulgar. Sometimes she said, I seen, and if I had have known. But what would grammar matter if he really loved her? He could not make up his mind whether to like her or despise her for what she had done. Of course, he had done it too. His instinct urged him to remain free, not to marry. While he was sitting helplessly on the bed in shirt and trousers, she tapped lightly at his door and entered. She told him all, that she had made a clean breast of it to her mother, and that her mother would speak with him that morning. She cried and threw her arms round his neck, saying, Oh, Bob, Bob, what am I to do? She would put an end to herself, she said. He comforted her feebly, telling her not to cry, that it would be all right. It was not altogether his fault that it had happened. He remembered well with the curious, patient memory of the celibate, the first casual caresses her breath, her fingers had given him. Then, late one night, as he was undressing for bed, she had tapped at his door timidly. She wanted to relight her candle at his, for hers had been blown out by a gust. It was her bath night. She wore a loose, open, combing jacket of printed flannel. Her white instep shone in the opening of her furry slippers, and the blood glowed warmly behind her perfumed skin. On nights when he came in very late, it was she who warmed up his dinner. He scarcely knew what he was eating, feeling her beside him alone, at night, in the sleeping house. Perhaps they could be happy together. They used to go upstairs together on tiptoe, each with a candle, and on the third landing they used to kiss. He remembered well her eyes, the touch of her hand, and his delirium. But delirium passes. He echoed her phrase, applying it to himself. What am I to do? The instinct of the celibate warned him to hold back. But the sin was there. Even his sense of honour told him that reparation must be made for such a sin. While he was sitting with her on the side of the bed, Mary came to the door and said that the missus wanted to see him in the parlour. He stood up to put on his coat and waistcoat, more helpless than ever. 
When he was dressed, he went over to her to comfort her. It would be all right, never fear. He left her crying on the bed and moaning softly, Oh, my God! Going down the stairs, his glasses became so dimmed with moisture that he had to take them off and polish them. He longed to ascend through the roof and fly away to another country where he would never hear again of his trouble. The implacable faces of his employer and of the madam stared upon his discomfiture. On the last flight he passed Jack Mooney. They saluted coldly, and the lover's eyes rested for a second or two on a thick bulldog face and a pair of thick short arms. Suddenly he remembered the night when one of the music hall artistes had made a rather free allusion to Polly. The reunion had been almost broken up on account of Jack's violence. The music hall artiste kept insisting that there was no harm meant. But Jack kept shouting at him that if any fellow tried that sort of game on with his sister, he'd bloody well put his teeth down his throat, so he would. Polly sat for a little time on the side of the bed, crying. Then she dried her eyes. She regarded the pillows for a long time, and the sight of them awakened in her mind secret, amiable memories. She rested the nape of her neck against the cool iron bed rail and fell into a reverie. There was no longer any perturbation visible on her face. She waited on patiently, almost cheerfully, without alarm, her memories gradually giving place to hopes and visions of the future. Her hopes and visions were so intricate that she no longer saw the white pillows or remembered that she was waiting for anything. At last she heard her mother calling. She started to her feet and ran to the banisters. Polly! Polly! Yes, Mama? Come down, dear. Mr. Doran wants to speak to you. Then she remembered what she had been waiting for. Eight years before, he had seen his friend off at the North Wall and wished him Godspeed. Gallagher had got on. You could tell that at once by his travelled air, his well-cut tweed suit. Few fellows had talents like his, and fewer still could remain unspoiled by such success. It was something to have a friend like that. Little Chandler's thoughts ever since lunchtime had been of his meeting with Gallagher, of Gallagher's invitation, and of the great city, London, where Gallagher lived. He was called Little Chandler because, though but slightly under the average stature, he gave one the idea of being a little man. As he sat at his desk in the King's Inns, he thought what changes those eight years had brought. The friend whom he had known under a shabby and necessitous guise had become a brilliant figure on the London press. He turned often from his tiresome writing to gaze out of the office window. A gentle melancholy took possession of him. He felt how useless it was to struggle against fortune. He remembered the books of poetry upon his shelves at home. He had bought them in his bachelor days, and often he had been tempted to take one down and read out something to his wife. But shyness always held him back. At times he repeated lines to himself, and this consoled him. When his hour had struck, he took leave of his desk. He emerged from the King's Inns and walked swiftly down Henrietta Street. He had never been in Corliss's, but he knew the value of the name. Walking by at night, he'd seen cabs drawn up and richly dressed ladies escorted by cavaliers alight and enter quickly. Ignatius Gallagher on the London press. Who would have thought it possible eight years before? People used to say that Ignatius Gallagher was wild. Of course, he did mix with a rakish set of fellows at that time drank freely, but nobody denied him talent. Little Chandler quickened his pace. For the first time in his life he felt himself superior to the people he passed, 
For the first time his soul revolted against the dull inelegance of Capel Street. There was no doubt about it. If you wanted to succeed, you had to go away. You could do nothing in Dublin. As he crossed Grattan Bridge, he looked down the river towards the lower quays and pitied the poor, stunted houses. They seemed to him a band of tramps, huddled together along the river banks, their old coats covered with dust and soot. He wondered whether he could write a poem to express his idea. Perhaps Gallagher could get it into some London paper for him. Every step brought him nearer to London, and a light began to tremble on the horizon of his mind. He was not so old, thirty-two. There were so many different moods that he wished to express in verse. If he could give expression to them in a book of poems, perhaps men would listen. He began to invent phrases from the notice which his book would get. Mr. Chandler has the gift of easy and graceful verse. Wistful sadness pervades these poems. The Celtic Note He pursued his reverie so ardently that he passed Corliss's and had to turn back. He hesitated, but finally entered. And there, sure enough, was Ignatius Gallagher leaning against the counter. Hello, Tommy, old hero. What'll you have? I'm taking whiskey. Better stuff than we get across the water. Here, garçon, bring us two halves of malt whiskey like a good fella. Well, and how have you been pulling along since I saw you last? Dear God, how old we're getting. Do you see any signs of aging in me? Little thin on the top, what? He bent his head and felt with two sympathetic fingers the thin hair. Little Chandler shook his head as a denial. It pulls you down, Ignatius Gallagher said. Press life. Always hurry and scurry, looking for copy. I feel a ton better since I landed again in dear, dirty Dublin. Here you are, Tommy. Water, say when. Little Chandler allowed his whiskey to be very much diluted. You don't know what's good for you, my boy, said Ignatius Gallagher. I drink mine neat. I drink very little as a rule, said little Chandler modestly. Ah, oh, well, here's to us and to old times. I met some of the old gang today, said Ignatius Gallagher. O'Hara seems in a bad way. He's gone to the dogs. Booze, I suppose. Other things, too, said little Chandler shortly. Ignatius Gallagher laughed. Tommy, you haven't changed an atom. You're still the same serious person that used to lecture me when I had a sore head. You'd want to knock about a bit in the world. Have you never been anywhere? I've been to the Isle of Man. Ignatius Gallagher laughed. The Isle of Man. Go to London or Paris. Have you seen Paris? I should think I have. And is it really so beautiful as they say? Asked little Chandler. Ignatius Gallagher finished his drink. Beautiful. It is beautiful. But it's the life of Paris. That's the thing. Little Chandler finished his whiskey and after some trouble succeeded in catching the barman's eye. He ordered the same again. I've been to the Moulin Rouge, Ignatius Gallagher continued. Hot stuff. Not for a pious chap like you, Tommy. Little Chandler said nothing until the barman returned with two glasses. He was beginning to feel somewhat disillusioned. There was something vulgar in his friend which he had not observed before. But perhaps it was only the result of living in London. The old personal charm was still there under this new gaudy manner. And after all, Gallagher had seen the world. Little Chandler looked at his friend enviously. Tell me, is it true that Paris is so immoral, as they say? I mean, compared with London or Dublin. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other. I say, Tommy, lick her up. No, really. Oh, come on, another one won't do you any harm. Well, all right. Francois, the same again. Will you smoke, Tommy? Ignatius Gallagher produced his cigar case. The two friends lit their cigars and puffed at them in silence until their drinks were served. I'll tell you my opinion, said Ignatius Gallagher. It's a rum world. Talk of immorality. I've known cases. He proceeded to sketch for his friend, in a calm historian's tone, some pictures of the corruption which was rife abroad. Little Chandler was astonished. How dull you must find Dublin. Well, said Ignatius Gallagher, it's the old country, as they say, isn't it? But tell me about yourself. I hear you've tasted the joys of connubial bliss. Two years ago, wasn't it? Little Chandler blushed. Yes, 
Well, Tommy, I wish you and yours every joy in life and tons of money. Any youngsters? Little Chandler blushed again. A little boy. Bravo! Little Chandler smiled and bit his lower lip with three childishly white front teeth. I hope you'll spend an evening with us. My wife will... Thanks, awfully, old chap, said Ignatius Gallagher, but I leave tomorrow. Tonight, perhaps? I'm awfully sorry, old man. You see, I've arranged to go on a little card party. Oh, but who knows, said Ignatius Gallagher considerately. Next year I may skip over here again. It's only a pleasure deferred. Very well, said Little Chandler. The next time you come we must have an evening together. Agreed? Agreed. And to clinch the bargain, said Little Chandler, we'll have one more now. Uh, very well, then. Let's have another one as a Jukundurus. That's good vernacular for a small whisky, I believe. Little Chandler ordered the drinks. The adventure of finding himself with Gallagher and Corliss's, of listening to Gallagher's stories, upset the equipoise of his sensitive nature. He felt acutely the contrast between his own life and his friend's, and it seemed to him unjust. Gallagher was his inferior in birth and education. He was sure that he could do something better than mere tawdry journalism, if he only got the chance. What was it that stood in his way? his unfortunate timidity. He wished to assert his manhood. He saw behind Gallagher's refusal of his invitation. Gallagher was only patronising him by his friendliness, just as he was patronising Ireland by his visit. The barman brought their drinks. Who knows, little Chandler said, lifting his glass, next year I may be wishing long life and happiness to Mr. and Mrs. Ignatius Gallagher. Ignatius Gallagher closed one eye expressively. No bloomin' fear of that, my boy. I'm going to have my fling first. Little Chandler smiled. Some day you'll settle down if you find the right girl. Well, if it ever occurs, you may bet your bottom dollar there'll be no mooning and spooning about it. I mean to marry money. There are hundreds of rich Germans and Jews that'd only be too glad. But I'm in no hurry. I don't fancy tying myself up to one woman. He imitated with his mouth the act of tasting and made a wry face. Must get a bit stale, I should think, he said. Little Chandler sat holding a child in his arms. He had come home late, and moreover he had forgotten to bring Annie the parcel of coffee from Bewley's. She was in a bad humour and had gone to the corner shop herself. She had put the sleeping child in his arms and said, Don't waken him. A lamp stood upon the table and its light fell over a photograph in a frame. It was Annie's photograph. Little Chandler looked coldly into the eyes of the photograph and they answered coldly. Certainly they were pretty, but there was no passion in them. He thought of what Gallagher had said about the rich Jewesses. Those dark oriental eyes, he thought. How full they are of voluptuous longing. Why had he married the eyes in the photograph? He glanced round the room. He found something mean in the pretty furniture which he had bought on the hire system. Annie had chosen it, and it reminded him of her. It too was prim and pretty. A dull resentment against his life awoke within him. Could he not escape from his little house? Could he go to London? If he could only write a book and get it published, that might open the way for him. A volume of Byron's poems lay before him on the table. He opened it cautiously, lest he should waken the child, and began to read the first poem. Hushed are the winds, and still the evening gloom. Not e'en a zephyr wanders through the grove. Whilst I return to view my Margaret's tomb, and scatter flowers on the dust I love. He paused. Could he, too, write like that, express the melancholy of his soul in verse? There were so many things he wanted to describe. His sensation of a few hours before on Grattan Bridge, for example. The child awoke and began to cry. He rocked it to and fro in his arms, but its wailing grew keener. It was useless. He couldn't read. He couldn't do anything. He was a prisoner for life. His arms trembled with anger, and suddenly bending to the child's face, he shouted, Stop! The child stopped for an instant, had a spasm of fright, and began to scream. 
He jumped up from his chair and walked hastily up and down the room with the child in his arms. It began to sob piteously, losing its breath for four or five seconds, and then bursting out anew. The thin walls of the room echoed the sound. He tried to soothe it, but it sobbed more convulsively. He looked at the contracted and quivering face of the child and began to be alarmed. He counted seven sobs without a break between them and caught the child to his breast in fright. If it died... The door burst open, and a young woman ran in. "'What is it?' she cried. "'It's nothing, Annie.' He began to cry. She snatched the child from him. "'What have you done to him?' she cried, glaring into his face. Little Chandler sustained for one moment the gaze of her eyes as he met the hatred in them. He began to stammer. "'It's nothing. He, 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 he began to cry. I didn't do anything.' Giving no heed to him, she began to walk up and down the room clasping the child tightly in her arms and murmuring, My little man, my little manny, was you frightened, love? There now, love, there now. Little Chandler felt his cheeks suffused with shame. He listened while the paroxysm of the child's sobbing grew less and less, and tears of remorse started to his eyes. <laughs>